the VO Meter, measuring your voiceover progress. Whether you're a veteran voice actor, just starting out, or don't even know how to set a level, we're here to help you avoid the pitfalls along your voiceover path to success. The VO Meter is brought to you by Voice Actor Websites, Studio Bricks, Global Voice Acting Academy, JMC Demos, and Sennheiser. The VO Meter is produced in part using Source Connect, made by source-elements.com. And now, your hosts, Paul Stefano and Sean Daly. Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 82 of the VO Meter. Measuring your voiceover progress. We've got an exciting show today. We're going to be talking about how, for some reason, we've been asked back again to be the official podcast of Evocation, and we'll be joined by the hosts and founders, Jamie Muffet and Karin Gilfrey, to talk about the upcoming Evocation on June 10th, 11th, and 12th. Awesome. Yeah, no idea why they asked us back. But before <laughs> that, <laughs> it's time for our... VoiceOver Extra brings you the VO Meter Reference Levels. Uh, seriously, guys, that's the best you could come up with? Hey, it's your show. So, Sean, what's happening in your VO world? Uh, the usual, you know, lots of auditions. So nothing? Oh. <laughs> no, no, it's not that bad. <laughs> um, yeah, just lots of auditions. Um, let's see, what else? A couple of corporate narrations uh, this week, and then... Some fun stuff. Actually, got asked to do, or and I know you did too, but we both got asked to be podcast guests on a podcast about podcasting. So that was fun. Um, yeah, very meta. Yeah, very super meta. Like, uh, and then it's like podcasting to the nth degree. But other than that, uh, I've just been doing a lot of work for GVAA. Our usual like registration just started. It's the beginning of the month, so have to make sure everyone gets lined up with the coaches they choose for that. Uh, meanwhile, the, the podcasting class that I'm teaching for Lander University is wrapping up, so I'm finishing up grading and, um, and then in sort of like my course assessments about how everyone did in the course. And then uh, other than that, uh, and I've got another uh, VO 102, 104 series coming up this weekend. So lots of, lots of VO education stuff and, and lots of auditioning and jobs. So pretty good stuff. What about you? Uh, similar stuff. I've had a bunch of auditions. I've been working on a couple of audiobook projects that just finished up. Uh, let's see. I just finished two two books with clients for Twin Flame Studios, the production studio I work for. Nice. And I'm currently in production on a book with Merrill Hodge, who is a former retired NFL running back and ESPN broadcaster and now professional professional speaker. So that was really exciting for me as a longtime sports fan to have someone who I literally watched on TV as a kid and then on TV as a commentator when I was in high school and college. I wouldn't say an idol because he played for the Pittsburgh Steelers, who's a rival of my affiliated football team, but uh, definitely somebody I admired and liked watching when I was growing up. So we'll be finishing that. It's actually what we call a hybrid book where Merrill's doing part of it, and then we hire a professional narrator to do the rest, and we sandwich it together into one nice happy package and the listeners get to hear Merrill's story in his own voice a bit and then a professional narrator do the rest very cool I like that that added dose of authenticity right it's exactly what it's supposed to do for people who either can't or don't want to do the entire book or just think that someone can do it better than them which often is the case if you hire a professional narrator <laughs> then it gives the listeners the best of both worlds they hear the author's voice a little bit and and hear what their take on the work is in their own words, and they get the, the fabulous storytelling. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then finally, it. I just finished my own narration of a book called Drugs as Weapons Against Us, the CIA's murderous targeting of SDS, Panthers, Hendrix, Lennon, Kobe, Tupac, and other activists by John L. Potash. And I think I talked about starting on this book a couple of months ago, but I finally finished it. And it's sent off to ACX. It should be out in the next day or two. So if you're shopping, maybe looking for a gift for Mother's Day, <laughs> uh, go ahead and Learn buy the book. The sorted history. <laughs> yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know what your mom's into, or your your girlfriend, or wife, or sister. You never know. Anyway, uh, please check it out and tell me what you think. Awesome. It's a real joy read. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that wraps up our VO reference levels. We're going to talk with uh, Karin and Jamie in just a minute, but before that, it's time for... 
questionable gear purchase. All right, so I've got lots to talk about. I've actually reconfigured my own booth. Uh, what about you? Do you have a lot of things to, to talk about, or who wants not, to go first? Not necessarily. I mean, I've like I've talked about this a couple times, but it's like I'm getting. I don't know, very gear lusty. Like, I feel, I'm like, everything's working too well for too long. I need to mix things up. Um, yeah, so I, know that I was feeling. actually like spending some time on the Evil Bay and try and actually found some good deals on a uh, Neumann TLM 102 and a Rode NTG5. Now, main thinking for these is that. Like, I don't know, I don't even know if I'm going to keep these mics, but I would like to have a backup of, like, shotgun microphone so I can keep the 416 in the booth and then maybe keep that as a dedicated web conferencing or a travel mic. And then, um, most listeners of the podcast know my, my regular uh, microphone is the Gefell M930, who has almost the exact same design language as the TLM 102. So I honestly just want to see, like, is it, like, is there any similarity in sound? Is it, like, is the 400 to 600 price difference justified, like, kind of thing? And, and since these are mics that people see very often, I just wanted to kind, or like, try and provide them with some samples for a mid-tier mic shootout so we'll see i'm still kind of waiting on what the uh on some auctions to turn out in the next couple of days so i'll keep you guys posted on that what about you so uh i did a lot again <laughs> so i started by tearing everything out of the booth at least all the equipment not the acoustics or foam or anything but uh i i had this desk a while ago that i bought when i first installed the studio bricks and i found this in my ne never ending testing of microphones, I heard this ringing in one of them. And I realized it wasn't the microphone, it was this like boom arm I had attached to the desk in order to get my monitor and iPad up so I could see it. And it wasn't even the boom arm itself. I had attached this, this like a uh, cell phone holder, iPad holder grip made by Archon to it. So I sort of jerry rigged it where I took the what, what should have been the mount for the monitor or TV panel and use the ball joint there to connect it to the Archon iPad stand and then push it up in the air so I could see it. But all that metal was causing a terrible ringing behind the microphone. So I panicked, of course, and tore all that out. First the desk, because the desk had a folding leg set. It was a folding table, basically. Took that out and then attached everything to a TV tray made of all wood, which I used when I first started out in voiceover. It was just something I had in the house, easy to put up, little... 15 by uh, 10 or 9 inch TV tray that you can fold up in a accordion fashion and stack on a rack and put in the corner of the room. So I used that, attached all the same apparatus to it, and then found the stupid ringing was still happening. So it turns out it was not the desk as I thought it was. It was the mechanism I'd used on the boom arm to get the iPad up. So I went shopping again. Now, the challenge I have is I have a really tiny space. The Studio Bricks is really narrow to begin with. And then I put in there... Uh, air filter I talked about a couple of months ago on the show. So their ventilator is down here, and that sort of creates even a smaller uh, width of the of the booth because the ventilator sits on the the way I'm facing is the front right side, and that it's like mm, 13 inches wide. So that cuts out 13 inches of space, which is already small to begin with. So what I end up doing is buying basically a computer cart, similar to what you use, I think. Um, and this, this one is all wood. It's from Amazon. And it has a articulating tray for the keyboard that goes up and down. It's about 12 inches deep. And it's only 15 inches wide. So that's perfect for what I need. It has the monitor to read scripts on and watch Zoom uh, calls or anything I need in the booth right in front of me. And then when I'm looking at the DAW, it's there too. Then I was able to put the same, uh, not the same, but a different iPad holder on the desk, get that iPad up over the keyboard so I can see. And so far, so good. I think everything is back to normal with the physical setup of all the equipment. And and we've talked about this before, but very often you'll find that it's like, if you're trying to fix one problem, everything's connected. So like you, sometimes you have to rip everything out in order to really isolate in in troubleshoot uh, but but yeah it just reminds me of like my own transitions to a more ergonomic space and honestly if you can if you can get all this stuff figured out 
<laughs> when you start, instead of like, I don't know, just throwing a bunch of stuff into your booth and then hoping it, praying it works. Um, highly recommend it just because like you have that control and then you can like you don't have to rip everything out. It's like when I added a, a boom arm or like uh, a couple months ago, I was just like, I was not expecting to have to pull the standing desk out. But like, just if you want things to fit where you want them to, you need that free space to do it. So yeah, I'm glad that you found a nice little standing desk solution. Yeah, I forgot about the boom arm. Actually, I had one of those too. So I was terrified to do this, but I did drill into the studio bricks. <gasps> Uh, Dear God. For our listeners who are out there, I did contact them first, and I, I asked support at Studio Bricks how, how deep of a screw I could use without going all the way through or damaging things. They replied right away. Miguel from, from Barcelona replied. No, they're, they're from Madrid. They replied and said, uh, no more than four centimeters long, which is mm, 0.5 inches. No. Yeah, 0.5 inches. So basically a half-inch screw is what you want to use. So I went and got that. Uh, length of a screw and screwed in the Heil bracket to, ha- to hang a boom arm. Thanks to Doug Curtell, D- Doug Curtell, <laughs> Doug Turkell, by the way, because I put a post on the Voice Over Pro's Facebook group asking if anyone knew if I could hang the, the Heil bracket. So this is the surface mounted bracket that has a hole to put any standard boom arm into. Usually you use it on a wall and the arm comes out of the bracket from the wall. So in this case, I wanted to put it on the ceiling because all the rest of the booth I had covered in blankets. And plus, I figured if I did screw up the booth, the ceiling would be the easiest part to replace rather than the intricately cut pieces that all fit together. So I put the I asked uh, on the group if I could put the bracket on the ceiling. And Doug, within like seconds, replied and said, oh, absolutely. I've done it for years with a picture. So it only took one response to get my answer. Thanks again, Doug. So then I did put the high bracket there screwed the boom arm in and have it hanging down now the only issue is i used i couldn't use the blue compass so the blue compass boom arm is what i was using and it wouldn't bend enough from this angle like it does work really well from either a desk or a wall mount but it seems to me that you can't really make it work on a ceiling mount so word to the wise if you're trying to figure that out it might not work because like it wouldn't straighten it enough wouldn't... or or hold its shape it's meant to go So if you have it on the desk, it's meant to have like the shorter part of the arm vertical and the longer part uh, at the L so you can have the space to move around the mic. So Mm -hmm. hanging hanging 90 degrees opposite of what it would be on, I guess 180 degrees opposite of what it would be on a desk, all that's backwards. And so it wouldn't bend enough the other way in order to let me get it in the the specific angle I need. It's basically like in my ear, is as, as far as I can bend it, which is not going to work for most voiceover. No, not Because really, but... it's not where your mouth is. <laughs> what did you end up using instead? Well, funny you should ask. I bought the InnoGear uh, boom, boom arm with no springs. So right now I'm using this old one I had. I think it's a Niewer one from Amazon, like five, ten bucks on Amazon with all the exposed springs. So hear those? <laughs> I'm going to have to uh, do something about that. So that's why I got this InnoGear arm, which has no the springs are in, internal, just like the Blue Compass or the Heil PR1 or PSA1. So now I've, I'll replace it with that. And it looks like that should work because it's it's much shorter. InnoGear has two versions. They have a really long version, which I think is 37 inches. And the one I got is only 14. So it should work just like this one I have. I just basically needed one for a narrower space. And I guess I should point out that if, if you have a bigger space in which to hang a booth, a uh, booth, arm from the ceiling, you may be able to use the blue compass, just not in the narrow width booth that I'm using right now. Good advice. And also, like we've said before, the blue compass can be very finicky with, with mic weight and stuff like that. If you're if you're using something like a TLM-103, that should be heavy enough, But or, or even a Rode NT-1. Um, but something like the 416 will definitely like go away like a kite, <laughs> or fly away like a kite from you. Um, but yeah. yeah, I'll mention the SM58 as well, because I was going to use the Blue Compass out at my editing desk where I used to have this springy one that didn't matter because it was only where I was editing. But the SM58, like you said, took off like a catapult when I tried to put it on the Blue Compass. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> at least it's a, a mic that's pretty durable. But, uh, but I, mean, yeah, I knew for... it, pro- I did, it didn't hit the floor. I knew it happened, so I caught it. <laughs> smart, smart. Your spider sense was tingling that day. Mm-hmm. But um but yeah, I mean, and, and I use a lighter mic too, like the Gefell and, and a Rycoat shock mount. And I actually needed to add a little bit of weight by by having a quick lock connector on it too, which also worked because it brought it closer to my mouth anyways. But yeah, so it's just funny where it's like, 
we've talked about this before, but it's like, I'm going to do this one thing in the booth, right? And then 10 steps later, it's, right? Um, so, yeah. It's like, yeah, because you don't think about all the permutations. And then, like you were saying before about trying to set it up right the first time, that's great advice, except... If you're a new voice actor, especially, you don't know where you need stuff exactly. until you need it. Exactly, and sometimes, so, that, like, perhaps more better advice is just patience and persistence, because you are going to fiddle and you are, like, going to be constantly making adjustments. I, I think um, Jim Edgar on his blog was talking about trying to make small adjustments, like, constantly making small adjustments, like adding a panel here or dealing with a bass trap there or... Um, or, like, yourself, repositioning your mic or trying to find more... Uh, ergonomic or uh, ways that better take advantage of the space, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. So, the last thing I'll mention is I'm using a new mic right now. Shocking, I know. <laughs> so, I was. You um, always assume that at this point. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, eyeing up a couple of items from Presonus, which is an audio uh, equipment company. So, I reached out to him and said, Hey, I got this stupid show. Um, would you like to have your stuff reviewed on it? And they said yes. So they've sent me right now a PD70 dynamic broadcast mic, and that's what I'm talking to you on right now. It's a big, fat uh, cardioid dynamic. Let's see. Let me read the spec. It's got a cardioid pattern. Um, it has a sensitivity of 1.6 MVP. A? I don't know what that is, honestly. Uh, and it has a, fr a frequency response of <laughs> uh, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and uh, an output impedance of 350 ohms. Am I reading that right? And by looking at it, it looks a lot like the SM7B, I got to say. Kind of like just... half the yoke cut off, it looks like. Yeah, yeah, it has it has a one sided yoke, uh, and you can flip it flip it around to use whichever side you want, which is kind of cool. The SM7B doesn't do that because it it gets stuck when you rotate it past a certain amount of distance, uh, and then it's got this big old grill on it, which I kind of like, and the sound is very reminiscent of all those other broadcast dynamics you might be familiar with: the SM7B being one, the RE20, the RE27, the RE320, the high L PR40 or 30 or 20. Uh, all the mics, uh, the Sennheiser 421, right? Or what's the other one, the the old radio broadcast mic? Oh, the, the Electro Voice RE20? Oh, the 421 or 441 from Sennheiser. Yeah. Those are both radio mic standards as well. Mm -hmm. So you can tell me what you think. Uh, listening to it, first, I think it's very clean. Uh, it might be a little too clean for my noisy mouth. But <laughs> overall, it's, it's a good sound for, I would say, podcasting. Mm -hmm. radio, broadcast. I don't know that I'd use it for a lot of voiceover. Uh, I do like using it for this because it's very forgiving. They were mowing my for, lawn. For a $130 mic, or like, for first off, like, I, inoffensive comes to mind. You know, it's not, like, not exciting, but certainly usable. And it doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't have the kind of the muddiness that you might associate with, with a dynamic. Um, I'm really curious how it might compare to, to like a similarly priced one, like, say, the Rode Pod mic or something like that. Um, yeah, I have used that the pod mic. I've used pretty much all of them. I think. Yeah, mic. I know you have. You, you the Rode the pod, pod mic, mic the, the Rode Procaster, the, 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 pod, the broad, Portcaster, yeah. not Portcaster, Procaster, and oh, what's the other one? Podcaster is it? Podcaster. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the USB version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have used an RE20 and a 320 and an SM7B <laughs> and a high old PR40. So yeah, where this sits in that that pantheon of all those broadcast mics, I think yeah, I would just kind of say meh. But in a good way. I don't know yeah, if yeah, yeah, like inobtrusive, doesn't draw attention to itself. <laughs> yeah, so it can be used. I would probably recommend this to pretty much anybody, and and say you could probably get a good sound out of it in in a well treated space or a decently treated space. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, the other thing I want to mention is XLR. So they do have a couple of new dynamic USB mics. This one is XLR only. Mm -hmm. uh, that may or may not be a consideration for you. But overall, I do like I do like the the versatility of it, and the noise floor is great. I'm looking. Let me see. I'm recording now. I'm looking at the noise floor. Everybody, shut up. Okay. Negative seventy seven in here in the in the studio bricks. Wow. And they're actually still mowing my lawn, so that's really good. Pretty awesome. <laughs> my noise floor with any condenser is more like sixty five to sixty nine. So. Mm -hmm negative hertz so this negative 77 is fantastic for any mic i'm not sure i've ever gotten anything that low in here so 
for that reason, it's great. It's a it's a easy to use. Will probably sound good on almost any voice. Um, I don't think I'll use it for commercial voiceover, but I may mix it into a couple audiobooks because I'm crazy like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm really curious how it would sound like uh, compared to some like condensers in that price range. You know, like the like the AT twenty 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 thirty five, or or even like the shotgun, the AT eight seventy five. Oh, I can tell you what I think of most of those. To me, they sound crunchy and offensive, especially in the highs. Almost mm-hmm. all of those sub one hundred dollar condenser microphones. I, I'm going to piss off a lot of people, I'm sure, but to me, they just don't sound. They're not worth it. The, the cons outweigh the pros. Yes, they might be cheap. Yes, they might be a, a decent sound on certain voices, but to me, the large amount of voices is going to be really crunchy and brittle in the highs. Yeah, my my sweet spot for for entry level mics is a little bit higher than the conventional wisdom, say 250 to 300. If you're spending that much then like and usually they have a fully integrated kit too, like I'm I'm talking like the Rode NT1, the Lewitt LCT 440, uh the SE 2200. Um well, I think all of those are going to be you're saying these are your your low Low point of entry, right? These yeah. are good. Oh, okay, never mind. So I thought you were saying those are no good. No, 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 not at all, not at all. Uh, like I said, it, it uh, like you when when you go a little bit less than that, like you start missing out. Like it, the the sound tends not to be as full, or maybe it overemphasizes unpleasant frequencies, or, or even mouth noise. So so yeah, that those would be my my first recommendations if you can stretch your budget. Yeah. So anyway, the, thanks to Personas for sending this to me. That's once again the PD seventy dynamic broadcast mic. If you want to pick one up, you can find it at presonus.com. That wraps up questionable gear purchases. We'll get to our interview with Jamie and Karin, the presenters of the Evocation Conference, in just a minute. But before that, a word from our sponsors. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control, and it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. How many times does this happen to you? You're listening to the radio when this commercial comes on, not unlike this one, and this guy starts talking, not unlike myself. Or maybe it's a woman that starts talking, not unlike myself, and you think to yourself, geez, I could do that. Well, mister, well, missy, you just got one step closer to realizing your dream as a voiceover artist, because now there's Global Voice Acting Academy. All the tools and straight-from-the-hip, honest information you need to get on a fast track to doing this commercial yourself. Well, not this one exactly. Classes, private coaching, webinars, home studio setup, marketing and branding help, members-only benefits like workouts, rate and negotiation advice, practice scripts, and more. All without the kind of hype you're listening to right now. Go ahead. Take our jobs from us. We dare you. Speak for yourself, buddy. I like what I do. And you will, too, when you're learning your craft at Global Voice Acting Academy. Find us at globalvoiceacademy.com. Because you like to have fun. Hey, everyone. Studio Bricks designs and creates the highest performing portable sound isolation booths. Our professionally perfected acoustics enhances your performance and takes your recordings to their maximum quality from your home studio. Forget about managing noise conflicts with your neighbors and family. Pursue your passion for voiceover on your own time and on your own terms. Walgreens, because it's flu season, you live in a place with doorknobs and handrails and, you know, people. We tried booking a vacation rental on one of those other websites. They don't always tell you everything. The stars take it to the red carpet. We are back live from the red carpet. California leads the way for change in America, and so does Kamala Harris. Rated M for Mature. 
Claire Redfield. And who exactly are you? So, yeah, what hashtag should I use to describe a grown man in a tuxedo wrestling a goat? And prior to 1933, many of them belonged to a variety of political parties that were now outlawed in Germany. This is the story of how Q got curly. Quinn was crazy about curls. Curly fries, curly straws, curly-haired dogs. Hey, Jay Michael here. Thanks for listening to the VO Meter podcast. It's one of my favorites. If you're looking for a great demo like the ones you just heard, check out jmcdemos.com for more information. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our interview portion of this episode of the VO Meter. Our guests today are two full-time voice talents who are not only extremely talented with a litany of impressive credits, but they are also paragons of voiceover education and community building. Our first guest is Karin Gilfrey, who is an experienced voice actor who's voiced thousands of commercials, instructional videos, IVR systems, e-learning programs, documentaries, and video games, and narrated and produced over 100 audiobooks. Her current and recent clients include FedEx, Volkswagen, Citibank, Duncan Hines, Denny's, Jack's Pacific Toys, and many, many more. She's also the creator of the Voice Actors of New York City Facebook group and co-creator of the National Association of Voice Actors, which you can find out more about at nava, that's N-A-V-A dot org, and co-creator of the VO Industry Survey. Her conference co-creator is Jamie Muffet, a British actor working out of New York City and Philadelphia, whose client list includes Google, Amazon, McDonald's, Microsoft, Warner Brothers, ESPN, NBC, ABC, National Geographic, and many others. He's also the voice and mind behind Backstage's In the Envelope podcast and the VO School podcast. So I am super excited to interview these co-founders and co-creators of the Vocation Conference, a virtual conference devoted to the business of voiceover. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Karin Gilfrey and Jamie Muffet. How's it going, guys? Hi! Good. Hey, Sean. That was like the Thanks nicest introduction ever. I, I, I I've know. never been called a paragon of education and community building before. It's really nice. Well, I'm going to send this to my parents. <laughs> you hear that, Mom? I'm a paragon. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. Are, they're going to finally be proud of me. Why, why wouldn't they? Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> for those who might not know or who haven't heard about eVocation or the Vocation Conference, what is it and what sets it apart from other voiceover conferences? Well, um, primarily we focus on the business of voiceover, which is our sort of USP, I guess. Um, we've been running since about 2019. Uh, well, exactly 2019. <laughs> it was our first conference. And then obviously since all hell broke loose in 2020, it's been virtual. And um, we've been, we did it in 2020, 2021, and we're doing it again this year in 2022. And uh, yeah, we cover a whole, the whole gamut of the business side of voiceover in terms of promoting yourself, learning about taxes, websites, uh, social media, marketing, rates, uh, the ins and outs of different genres, how they operate and things like that, and a whole bunch more too. So um, yeah, that's our thing. We don't do performance. Um, it's really just about the ins and outs of operating as a voice actor um, in 2022. That's our goal. Which to me is like and you can agree, Jamie and Sean, if you agree or disagree, but the business side of being a voice actor is like 80% of the job, at least. <laughs> you know, we spend we spend so little time comparatively in the booth doing actual work. Like the whole rest of it. I mean, maybe if you're an audiobook narrator, you're spending hours and hours in the booth doing actual work. But um, if if you're doing commercials and other things, you, you're in the booth for a short amount of time and the rest of the time you're writing invoices and you're writing emails and you're communicating with your agent and you're doing auditions and you're doing your taxes and all this other stuff that is such a big part of what we do for a living and and takes a long time to kind of learn and master. So... Well, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's how you get to do the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Let's talk about the conference, both both last year's and what's coming up soon. So what were some of the, the highlights from last year's conference? I mean, I think I think the thing that just really surprised me that I absolutely loved and didn't expect was just like the sense of community that we all felt 
online yeah. at an online conference. I went I went this past year to VO Atlanta and it was the first in-person conference I had ever been to besides ours that we <laughs> our own that we put on in 2019. Um but you know, uh, there were so many people that I met there that I absolutely loved and I felt like I got to know people, but I kind of knew a lot of them already from vocation and from and from meeting them in zoom rooms and from seeing them in classes and and interacting with them at our parties and stuff and our our coffee room and all of that stuff it it was it the online conferences that we put on were surprisingly social and i feel like i got to know a lot of really amazing people who then when i met in person it was like we'd been friends for years because I guess we had been, but just we'd never seen each other's legs before. <laughs> <laughs> One of the least important parts of the thing that you get it to see probably anyway, is. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I think I think that's the sort of big takeaway each time we do it is that wow, I've, I feel like I've been to a social event and am exhausted in the same way as <laughs> after attending a social event. Um, but yeah, it's it's really um, it, it it can. You would think that it would be a cold, lonely exist, you know, um, experience, but it really isn't. It is very social. One of the reasons for that, or one of the ways we make it so as, as social as possible, is because, you know, networking and getting to know other voice actors is also part of the gig, you know, and and growing your social circle, and not just for cynical business reasons, but also a sense of camaraderie and education and things like that. You know, it's so important. And we thought initially, how would we do that in the sort of virtual space? And, you know, like Zoom, everyone's so familiar with Zoom now. Um, also incorporating social media into that as well. We have a special, a special um, Facebook group that is just for attendees and that's so that's buzzing over the course of the weekend and for weeks after the event too and people sort of continue conversations online that way that's such a big takeaway and of course last year for me one of the big takeaways was Gilbert Gottfried who oh, no. <laughs> we had as a guest the oh, late great no. Gilbert Gottfried yeah he was such a that was such an amazing experience to have him you know perform at, at our opening night party and he was such a generous guy and uh, yeah we're really sad to see that um, you know he's no longer with us yeah, even even though it was over Zoom, it still felt like a once in a lifetime opportunity and I and I'm really grateful that I was able to go there yeah for those of you who happen to be in the Vocation Voiceover Facebook group, Jamie actually posted a video of Gilbert of Gilbert Gottfried um, at our opening night party, and it is like one of the funniest thirty <laughs> minutes you can watch. Even now, watching it, it's like <laughs> I mean, my face just hurt, laughing. and I was just in tears. It was yeah, just, oh, I could barely see. It was ridiculous. But I totally agree. I was surprised by just that that emphasis on the social aspect, inviting people to make cocktails with your dad, Karen, or, yeah. or watching Gilbert perform, or like you said, encouraging people to be active on social media, giving them things to do and, way, and other ways to interact, especially for people who might be looking at this, who might be kind of like social introverts or might be in their shell a little bit. Those kind of activities are really beneficial. The other thing that I love about the virtual conference is that I feel like so many more people can attend who would not be able to attend if it was in person. Like whether they have accessibility issues with an in-person conference or there's a financial constraint, you can't just spend a ton of money on flights and hotels and, and, and the conference fee. Um, attending virtually is it, it's beneficial for so many people. And that's why... Jamie actually came up with a brilliant idea for this year's uh, evocation, um, because Jamie, do you want to talk about it? You can you can probably explain it better than I can. Yeah. Um, well, we we thought, what are the real benefits of being at home when you're at a conference? <laughs> and one of the big things is that you're surrounded by all of your stuff. You're in your office or you're at home with with all your paraphernalia of what you do for your business or how you do your business. So we thought, well, how can we exploit that? And really what our conference is, is v essentially very educational. You know, because it's the business side, you can apply things I mean, essentially immediately in your career. Um, it's not like a sort of performance thing where, you know, might pick up a few nuggets here and there and you, who knows when those are going to come out. Um, 
these sort of very applicable knowledge you can apply straight away. So we wanted to take take advantage of that and so after each class where we've got a workshop where you can take what you learnt in the class and then apply it immediately. Now they that may be specifically like I always use the example of maybe changing or tweaking your website or getting some specific feedback from a group because what we're going to do is we're going to open up multiple zoom rooms and then you're going to be filtered into the rooms based on you know your preference or your skill level or your you know whatever it is and then you can either use the wisdom of the crowd to help you sort of figure stuff out just you know take the conversation further and um, dive a little deeper or use that time just to work on your stuff on your own or in maybe small groups like a couple of two or three people so um, what we're trying to do is avoid that thing of when you come home from a conference and you've got a million notes and a bunch of different sheets of paper and then you just sort of bury them in a drawer and don't look at them again um, we want you to start applying the knowledge immediately so by the end of the weekend you will have made a step forward in your career um, not just you know socially or like with internal pro progress actual real world progress you know man that is that is amazing i mean not only is that just good from an educational scaffolding standpoint you're like you learn something you apply the information to solidify that learning but like you said it's so easy to a fall into analysis paralysis when you've got all this information you're like how do i dissect it how do i apply it and then just the momentum that is lost in in the uh, like once the the glow is over right so or the, the the experience is fading so that is such a great idea yeah i thought so well speaking of applicable knowledge what are uh, some of the presenters and topics that you're excited about covering this year I'm particularly excited um, about one panel that we have, which we've talked about a lot. Um, we're calling it We Don't Talk About Fiverr, No, No. <laughs> um, it's so catchy. I can't get it so out of my catchy. head. So um, catchy. Yeah. But basically, it's it, we have people from all these various uh, freelancer websites and people who are kind of who've done well on them and who have maybe just dabbled and some people are who are kind of opposed to them. And we want to just actually talk about what sites like Fiverr and Upwork mean for our industry. Um, and if there is a way to use them ethically, how, how do we do that? Is there a stigma attached to having a profile on Fiverr? Will agents not uh, add you to their roster if they see that you're also on Fiverr. I just we just really wanted to dive into that issue because I think it's something that that um if you mention in a Facebook group, hey, I have a profile on Fiverr, immediately <laughs> a bunch of people will jump on Good you luck. and say that you are <laughs> destroying the industry. Yeah. So is that really the case? Are people on Fiverr really destroying our industry? I, I I would I would hope not, but let's have a discussion about it and, and figure out, you know, what what Fiverr and all that stuff is all about. So Well, I love that I mean you've you've done this with, with AI voices, for example, but picking these these controversial topics and, and providing a platform where people can talk about them without judgment. It, it's very helpful. Speaking of AI, actually, we also have Rupal Patel from Vocal ID um, talking with Jim Kennelly and the folks at Lotus Productions. Uh, they're going to be coming to talk with us about AI voices, and and uh, we'll kind of be able to get a lot of our questions answered about that stuff too. That's good because we did a similar-ish thing in 2019, and now we're sort of three years later. It's going to be interesting to see where where we are right now. Um, yeah. That journey is, you know, not, is it where they expect it to be? I feel like in 2019, it was still kind of a hypothetical, you know, like if voice actors made synthetic voices, then what could happen to the industry? And now it's like, I have 10 friends who have synthetic voices. I have two synthetic voices. <laughs> So like now that we have these synthetic voices, what is happening and what do we do with them and how are they being marketed and how do we protect ourselves from having them stolen and all of that stuff. So I think that's going to be really interesting too. I had an audition yesterday that specifically stated no synthetic voices, please. <laughs> so what does that mean? I I'll don't tell know. my AI that she can't audition. Anyways. <laughs> As I said in your intros, I believe I called you paragons of community. <laughs> but 
you both, I'm serious, you both really spearheaded your own respective VO communities and, and, and sort of merged them. But that sense of community and paying it forward is really present and prescient in this conference. And I feel like nothing really encapsulates that idea than just the sheer number of scholarships that you offer to, to people who might not have the finances to attend this conference. I think it's incredible. It's it's been amazing. We had we had 27 scholarships to award um, this year, and almost all of them were donated by members of our community who either won scholarships in the year previous or they um, they were speakers who were donating their speaker fees or just people from the community saying this is something that I really want to do because I think someone will benefit a lot from this. Um, and so we had just r regular people paying for a ticket for someone else to come to the conference. And it, it just fills me with so much hope for humanity. And, and our business is awesome. I just love it. Yeah. And it was funny because it was um, it was started all the way back in 2019 when Joe from Voice Actor Websites gave up his speaker fee to uh, a, a ticket uh, for next for the following year for uh, for someone. And uh, we sort of posted about that. And then I don't know who the the next person was that did it but they started the ball rolling with oh well actually I want to do the same thing and then it's just gotten I think last year we had 15 like Karen said this year we've got 27 so it's just a wonderful group effort and thank you Sean because you donated a scholarship to evocation and a person is going to get to go because you donated a scholarship it's wonderful thank you Ah, oh, shucks. <laughs> it means a lot. And I know, I mean, people who've listened to the podcast know I've personally benefited a lot from, from conferences back when, like, I mean, I won a scholarship way back in 2016 to attend VO Atlanta for the first time. And I, and it was very life-changing. So I know how how impactful it can be. And also, like you we were saying, the accessibility. Do you have the finances? Can you budget for the travel? Like the, the logistics of the situation? Can you get time off work or away from your family? It's a very small way to, a small meaningful way to give back to someone and, and cause that same impact. And yeah. sometimes just that little bit of positivity can just give you a little nudge that you may not have otherwise had you know aside from the actual specific knowledge that you get from the conference it's just this little boost i think all around from those receiving it and those giving it it's just it's just a positive thing all around i think yeah it's like a sign from the universe you're on the right track someone believes in you <laughs> We announced actually the scholarships today and, and so many people have come back and in the emails have said that, you know, oh, I was having a rough day and now this has turned it all around. And, you know, it's just it's just such a wonderful thing. Makes my heart smile, too. You guys must feel great. So as you mentioned, the applications have closed for, for this year's conference, but you don't have to lose hope yet because I've heard rumblings on the grapevine that you guys have some very exciting news about the next evocation conference or should i say the next vocation conference it's vocation we're back <laughs> we're back <laughs> we are going to do vocation in person in new york city september 10th and 11th which i'm so excited about i moved away from new york city during the pandemic and any chance that i have to go back to my home feels like a great one um we're gonna have some amazing speakers uh it's gonna be at symphony space again like it was in 2019 um and we're just so happy to be back so yeah and i'm sure we'll have i'm sure we'll have scholarship opportunities for vocation uh nyc in september as well Amazing. Well, that's awesome. I'm so excited for you guys. So if people want to go to eVocation that's coming up and they have the resources, how can they do that? Just go to vocationconference.com. That's the easiest way. All the links are there. You can go straight to the Eventbrite page and that'll be where you buy your ticket. Um, you can also find out more about the conference there. Um, there's also links to our social media. We're probably most active on Facebook in our Facebook group, Vocation Voiceover. Um, but yeah, you can uh, you can find us all over the shop. 
We also, for the first time this year, uh, have a replay only option. So if you know that you can't attend uh, the weekend that vocation is happening, but you still see the speakers and the panelists and all that, and you think, wow, I really wish I could have access to all that. Um, you can down, you can buy a replay only option, which will give you access to watch everything uh, for two weeks after the conference. All right. Well, thank you both so much for being on the podcast. I've got a lot of love and respect for both of you and what you're trying to accomplish with this conference. And I'm just really excited to be going to the next one in a couple weeks. Yay! Yeah, we love you right back, Sean. Oh, shucks. (laughs) Making my heart (laughs) smile left and right this time. (laughs) Thank you both again for coming, and thank you all out there for listening. Hey, VO Meter fans, it's Paul back with you, talking about our promotion with Voice123. Yes, you can still save 15% on any new membership plan with Voice123. To take advantage of the offer, just go to our website, vometer.com, click on the Sponsors tab, and then where you see the Voice123 logo, just click on the big fat button that says Click to Save 15%. Good luck, and thanks for listening to the VOMeter. Thank you so much, Karin and Jamie. It was great talking with you guys again. I love everything that this conference is about. It it talks about a very important, valuable part about what we do, and it makes it a lot more enjoyable and accessible for people who either can't attend live or they don't have the finances to do so. So it was really great talking with you guys. And just the fact that you got almost 30 scholarships is is just incredible i i can't believe it uh the the generosity of the vo community knows no bounds i would agree this this conference has always been fantastic to me i i can't imagine going there and not and not meeting somebody that you can work with in the future i got an audition from a company i met there at the first ever uh, vocation conference not an hour ago and they send them to me all the time and somebody i met there networked with and now that now they're a, a source for jobs so you will meet somebody. You might be an agent. It might be a referral from a fellow talent. It might be a casting director. It's really a place that you can actually get a huge return on your investment. Yeah, we talked about that too. And just and now what they're trying to do with sort of uh, the direct application of the knowledge that you make, uh, like with some of these workshops that follow up after uh, the, the actual presentations is a really good idea. So... Uh, if you're interested in going to either evocation or vocation, which is coming in September in person, you can find out information about that at vocationconference.com. And once again, that evocation will be going on June 10th, 11th, and 12th. So that's coming up very soon. So if you're interested, definitely check out vocationconference.com. We hope to see you there. We'll be doing interviews with the speakers leading up to the conference, and we'll do some on the ground. I'm doing air quotes, on-the-ground virtual interviews at the conference. And I will be a presenter again. So if you want to learn about all the freelance sites to find jobs out there, come to the panel that includes me and Peter Bishop, among others. All right, looking forward to it. That wraps up this episode of the VO Meter. Measuring your voice over progress. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the VO Meter. To follow along, visit us at www.vometer.com. We'd also love to hear your comments or suggestions for the show. Or if you have a questionable gear purchase, tell us all about it on our Facebook page or on Twitter at the VO Meter. <laughs>